to give a very big thank you to my tier 5 channel members and patrons. Bob the Dragon, Data Magnet, Cat Crab Lobster, Duck Machine, Try Again 95, Estrella the Dreamer, Mesic, Feudic Joel, German Chemist, and Casper Amholtz. Thank you again very much. What do unstoppable death worlders fear? Written by Eclipse Shadow. Data entry, species of Mega 49. Hewitt, sir. What can slow them down, let alone stop them? They seem to have infinite potential, capability of understanding the most complex of subjects. Yet, the average human only seems to be moderately capable at best. How is the base of Mega-class Death World has managed to survive, let alone thrive on terror? For any new individuals reading this series of entries who haven't taken any planetology classes, Death Worlders on their primary surviving inhabited are classified as follows. Alpha Class or Class 1 Death Worlds. Mostly habitable, but have one primary threat to life on the planet. Be that threat, disease, or seasoned predatory species, or the common natural disaster. Beta Class or Class 2 Death Worlds like alpha glass planets, but having two threats to sentient life. An example being acid rain and a predatory species immune to it. Such a planet ARSD3 in the Liumph sector. Delta class or class 3 death worlds. There are many known delta class death worlds, but the most infamous has toxic cloud disaster every rotation. Predators immune to the toxins within the cloud and frequent planet wide quakes. No mega class or class 4 death worlds. These are planets with four or more threats to life. And as of writing this, there are only one that has created sentient life capable of space-faring technology. The planet would be Terra, or as the inhabitants, humans call it, Earth. This Omega class death world holds numerous predators on every continent. Devastating tectonic quakes, droughts, floods, tornadoes, hurricanes. There's a season for hurricanes. Couple that with countless plagues and diseases, and the fact that anything can live, let alone thrive down there, put enough fear into the Galactic Council to spur multiple debates on whether or not just to destroy the planet and hope that it would kill the species. Most beta and above class death worlds tended to be openly hostile from the start. But not the humans. Strangely, they came in peace. It was unnerving just how open to peace they were. What were these creatures up to? It was during these initial interactions when this team was formed as a precaution if they really did come in peace. Formerly, we are just ambassadors and scientists gathering information on human physiology and preferences so that the rest of the Galactic Council members know what they can and cannot ingest, what drinks are harmful, what diseases to watch out for. In reality, our goal was to find their weakness, what could kill them, what could stop them, what they fear. What we learned about them shook us to our very core. These humans have a genre of video called horror. We believe that this is what they fear the most. Why they watched it was beyond our comprehension, perhaps as a test of courage. Many of these horror movies terrifies our crew. The humans seem to fear nigh impossible to exist creatures. Monster killers capable of tearing them from limb from limb. Dangerous killers capable of being everywhere at once. Unfortunately for us, one of the members of the team happened to be a Italian spy. The Italians began their campaign using psionics and biotechnology to manifest these creatures, make those nightmarish beings a reality to clear a human colony. It worked in the beginning. Humans ran terrified from them, but went backed into a corner. That is when we learned about one of the most interesting attributes. Humans get themselves high biologically. They have a gland that releases a rather potent combat drug into their body. With that adrenaline high, the human is capable of feats that should be impossible for them. Lifting tanks to save the young, surviving what should be fatal injuries, and, yes, killing monsters that should not even exist. The humans, after realizing these creatures could bleed, 
realized that they could just as easily die, and began exterminating the monstrosities with brutal efficiency. On that note, we also learned just how easy it is for a human to turn anything into a weapon for brutalizing their enemy. With the Delian treachery came the sanctions and punishment, but what was most frightening was what the humans did with some of the captured Delian diets. The humans, for some bizarre reason, began giving them the life of luxury. It seemed odd. Why reward someone for the act of aggression? Were they being brainwashed? No, it would not be for several planetary cycles before we would learn just what the humans were up to. The humans somehow managed to make themselves psionic. Through some advanced biotechnology, they altered some of their own and granted them psionic power. After studying the scions and how their powers worked, humans reverse-engineered biology to create augmentations that would let themselves use psionics. While not as powerful as other scions, the humans showed their capabilities when they did what many saw as impossible. They had manipulated psionics to the point where they could use what they referred to as magic. Using highly focused telekinesis, they superheated the air through friction. Then threw a newly formed fireball with such accuracy and force that it seemed impossible to dodge. The humans, in a few years of having psionics, evolved psionics. Opened new doors that many races thought impossible. Even using telekinesis to manifest a psychological presence alongside oneself to aid in battle. Back to our study, we had no better luck in understanding their fears or weaknesses. Any bodily weakness we found they had accounted to. Disease, their immune system could fight it. If not, they used various antibiotics and other medicines to fight off symptoms and outlast the disease, then take parts of the dead disease cells and inject it into their own. The humans were intentionally infecting their own with disease and illness to give them immunity to them in the future. Though, in hindsight, that shouldn't be surprising from the species that regularly drinks poison for recreational purposes and only gets minor headaches from their, uh, hangover. As for any other weakness of the body, they can just as easily replace any destroyed part with a stronger mechanical part, which, uh, if this part is an extremity or outer body part, will no doubt have a weapon all three attached. The Garum found that out the hard way. The upstart warmongers thought that the humans were weak and their territory had plenty of valuables. They invaded without warning. The four armed brutes overwhelmed the humans using what many of them would consider a tank cannons as rifles. While the initial attacks were devastating, killing several hundred humans and wounding countless thousands more. Subsequent attacks had broader results. The true war, however, didn't begin until the original wound had returned. These humans seemed different, cold, emotionless perhaps. Not there, but only one emotion they showed. Pure, absolute rage. They could not die. Whatever augmentations they had replaced with their lost parts would not let them die. Even if you blew off the other arm, it would grow back near instantly. In true human tradition, these augmentations for outer body parts, i.e. arms, were equipped with mounted guns. And those guns were themselves equipped with a bayonet. Sometimes, of all the bigger guns, a chainsaw was used. This war lasted less than three cycles. The humans had shown their ingenuity, creativity, and their unstoppable resolve. These humans had no limits. When they hit said limits, they'd push their bodies to go beyond them. That adrenaline that naturally produced seemed to remove their limits, even allowing some of their cybernetically augmentations to bypass the limits of the more biomechanical parts. No, I don't mean they could shoot faster or anything like that. What I mean is if the biomechanical arm could lift 150 tons, under adrenaline they could push those limits and do 300 tons. While pushing their bodies that far does damage it, and the body repairs itself and upgrades itself. Through breaking their limits, they gain newer, higher limits. It still brought the question, 
Now why? Why is it that they can continuously improve? They are like their own ships, constantly being improved upon, made better and stronger, but able to improve and strengthen the body within its own lifespan. That, uh, that should be impossible for any species. There was also the question about why humans seem to love attaching blades to their projectile weapons, and why they would charge headfirst into an enemy with said weapon instead of reloading. Of all this and many more questions that needed answering, we have agreed to enlist the aid of a few human scientists. To answer a few questions about the humans, we got answers that were forthcoming yet odd. Why would the humans just tell us these things? Their love for attaching bayonets and charging into things. Well, if you run out of ammo or someone gets too close, you're gonna need a plan B. So we used knives at the end of our guns to use as impromptu spears or strike the foe in the jaw with the butt of our rifle. How do they regenerate and grow stronger? Our bodies make stem cells which will batch up the damage. Platelets will clot up and stop the bleeding if any, though we found ways to modify our stem cell production. This allows us to basically manufacture them for whatever we need, even growing back the numbers. Of course, we also tinkered with making organic weaponry, hence the newer replacements coming in with built-in weapons. Why? Why do you tell us these things? I asked. Simple. You asked. Dr. Roberts responded. Is there anything that humans even fear? You people seem nigh and stop. Good luck in your ability to just do anything. I would soon regret asking that question. For what I learned was of cosmic horror. What the humans fear deep down is something so unimaginably large that it would in all likelihood be unable to exist. A being of such overwhelming power that its very presence would drive those who see it mad. Dr. Roberts spoke of Aldrich horrors and Lovecraftian monstrosities that would break anyone's sanity. The human sphere that which was so powerful, the only option to face it was to cope that it didn't care enough to kill you. When asked about what the Tellians created, Dr. Roberts merely chuckled. One fatal flaw in what the Tellians made, those creatures could bleed. They were mortal. And, well, as we say, if it bleeds... We can kill it. Gotta admit, it was funny seeing horror movie monsters being destroyed by the mining troll. Good thing they didn't try to create xenomorphs. Then we may have had a problem. Sure, we could have just glassed the planet. Not even gonna bother with those things. But those little bastards tended to somehow always survive and find a way with the planet. I hesitated to ask about xenomorphs, sir. But when I did, I was both horrified that they could even imagine such a disturbing creature. But I was also relieved knowing that we hadn't even seen those movies. If the Italians made that... No. no. I don't even want to think about the aftermath of such a disaster. I don't even question why they'd imagine such creatures. Given just how unstoppable and limitless humans are, it seemed only natural that monsters of unimaginable power and destructive capabilities would be the only things humans would even see as a threat. End of report. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed.